This is the Avaya Podcast Network. APN. Technology, news, and information. All in one place. What did Hurricane Sandy do for emergency services and social media? Find out next on the E911 Talk Podcast, Episode 113. Recorded Friday, November 9th, 2012. Welcome to this edition of E911 Talk with your host, Mark Fletcher, Pilot Line Manager for Emergency Services at Avaya. Now, here's Fletch. After 10 days in the dark with limited internet, I was certainly ready to go back to work this week when the lights finally came on this past Wednesday. The ferocious nature and incredible devastation caused by this single storm certainly taught many some valuable lessons. Although I had access to the internet through a 4G wireless connection, I was pretty much doing more reading than tweeting. But what really amazed me was the amount of information that was being shared as this event touched such a large population over a huge area. Now, in addition to the obvious sources for information like the American Red Cross, FEMA, as well as the ready.gov site, hashtags like need gas zip code, hashtag charging station, hashtag warming shelter, and many others show the world what a little situational awareness could do for people that were in need. Emergency call takers and the voice-only system that allows them to perform their job became incredibly taxed as literally millions of people started reaching out for help and information. But making a phone call was becoming more and more difficult. Many landlines were out of service due to an infrastructure being torn to shreds and a wireless network that just simply got overloaded as people turned to their cell phones to establish basic connectivity. In fact, many of you may have noticed that although voice calls were failing, SMS messages were making it through. If you've been following the news around Next Generation 911, you'll know that one of the benefits that are being promoted is the ability to send a text message to 911 call takers, or even pictures and video. Since a text message is very different from a voice call and uses a completely different infrastructure, there's a challenge with getting a text message from a device in the field to a specific 911 call taker. There are also concerns from public safety officials that since there is no guaranteed delivery of these messages, it may actually put people at further risk. In many of the trials that are happening around the country, there's been a question looming wondering if we really need text to 911, since the use of the trial systems has been extremely limited. Initially, this concerned me, but after living through Sandy, I've come to some rationalizations that bring a little sense to those statistics. In a recent article published by 911.com about social media's new role in emergency response, Emily Rahinmi, and I apologize, I'm sure I'm massacring that name, is responsible for the FDNY's Twitter account. She explained that there were plenty of people saying they were trying to call 911 and it would connect for a second and then drop. So they tweeted. Now this is a very important fact that hasn't come to light in the trials mainly because there have been no massive disasters that would have changed people's communications habits. The environment that the trials have taken place in has been, for the most part, sunny day operations. Of course, I'm not talking about the weather here. We're talking about normal operation days where there is no mass calling event or disaster taking place. One thing that the industry has always been concerned with is that if texting to 911 was possible and enabled, The public may overuse this reportedly less reliable technology, and it could overload emergency dispatchers and actually reduce efficiency. Well, with Sandy hitting one of the largest cities in the United States, we have a perfect example of the public using text to 911 only as an alternative. And we also have an example of a single hardworking individual answering those calls for help. From a voice perspective, NYPD, FDNY, and EMS have about 1,500 call takers and dispatchers on duty that answer the 11 million calls for help each year, according to an NYPD press release from January. As always, if you want the link for that, check out my blog on www.avaya.com forward slash Fletcher. Now those are absolutely staggering numbers, and you can certainly see the reason for concern. Texting and responding to text messages could be viewed as very specific skill sets, not that different from a language. I think New York answers their 311 center in something like 57 different languages, all based on skill sets. Given the technology behind today's contact centers, this is exactly the information that can be used to analyze calls in queue, make a decision as to who should get what call, or how the request for assistance should be routed. 
Here's one of my favorite scenarios for NextGen 911, an intelligent call handling using additional data that's received with the call. Someone has an accident on the side of the road and the center receives 20 to 30 calls about the same incident. While they're being tied up with all of those inbound calls, calls are overflowing to auxiliary centers, basically taking them out of service for a single event. The reason that Avaya thinks that contact center technology needs to be brought into public safety is not to put people on hold and tell them that their expected time in queue is three minutes and that their call will be answered in the exact order that it's received. What we want the contact software for is to take advantage of routing. We can take advantage of prioritization. We can take advantage of triaging technologies and techniques and then apply them to the public safety environment. What we saw with Sandy is that the square key system model, line one, line two, line three, etc., that services the majority of the PSAPs in the United States, pretty much blew up. It blew up because everyone called at once, and there were more callers than there were call takers. And really, there's no alternative for that model other than putting on more people and getting more lines. Even then, if you exceed what's there, you're going to blow up the system. We need to take the contact center technology out of the contact center and put it into the PSAP and embrace it, instead of being afraid of it. In fact, if you pick apart the next-gen 911 architecture, it's clear that someone has baked that technology in there. Contact center technology is already positioned to far exceed the required capacities for next generation 911 today. In fact, there are other services such as utility companies that also deal with the mass influx of calls during a severe storm that already use this very same technology. In fact, the utility company has more tools to deal with the mass call event than the 911 center has because they use that contact center model. With the same event happening to public safety, they blow up. Why? Because they use the square key system environment. The folks running the 911 networks will soon realize that the problems they're experiencing now and the new ones that they're about to experience with next generation 911 have already been, for the large part, already solved in the enterprise environment many years ago. The value that contact centers bring is that we can extract tremendous amounts of information and situational awareness by working with that big data in a big way. You've been listening to the E911 Talk Podcast with your host, Mark Fletcher, Product Line Manager for Emergency Services at Avaya. E911 Talk is a weekly podcast available on sites like this, as well as iTunes, and is available free of charge. If you have any comments or questions, you can email Fletch at FletcherM at Avaya.com. That's Fletcher, the letter M, at Avaya.com. Be sure to listen in next week for more informative topics on E911. 911, the line is recorded. What is the exact location of your emergency? This is the Avaya Podcast Network, APN.